Our two guest speakers tonight will tell us that there are at least two roads that lead to the stars. The first speaker, Judd Wynn, is an explorer and scientist who through the exploration and research into the caves of Earth is pushing the envelope to resolve our road to the stars and back. He started out as a conservation biologist, and in the course of studying insects, bats, and any animals that call caves and the subterranean world their homes, he took his research a step further to assist humankind in making it to the stars and beyond. Judd is a passionate explorer and an Explorers Club fellow, having flown the famed Explorers Club flag 13 times since 2008. He currently resides in Flagstaff, Arizona, where he is a cave research scientist and is a doctoral candidate in biological sciences at the Northern Arizona University. Please welcome Mr. Judd Wynn. Thank you very much, everyone. All of you love bugs. <laughs> Some of you may not be aware of that fact, but all of you love bugs. Many of you have borrowed from the entomological world and have woven it into your stories. Many of those aliens from other galaxies and planets look a lot like the bugs that you'll find in your own backyard. Even Hollywood has the bug. Numerous Hollywood movies have used insectoids as their evil alien antagonists. Recent examples include Starship Troopers, Starship Troopers Invasion, Men in Black 1 and 2, and the upcoming Enders game. But let's rewind to the 1979 classic film, Alien. The movie starts with that infant alien emerging from the belly of its human host. Far-fetched in the world of insects? Absolutely not. Parasitoidal wasps inflict the same carnage on, all, on their insect hosts all of the time. It's how they make a living, and it's probably happening this very minute. <laughs> so here's the play-by-play. -play. A pregnant female wasp captures an insect. She paralyzes and zombifies it with a sting to the brain. She then drags this poor animal into its death tomb, and deposits her egg on the insect. Over the next several days, the larva emerges, begins to feed on its host, bores into it, and consumes it from the inside. <laughs> Truth is stranger than fiction, right? <laughs> then, just like that adorable little alien baby, the juvenile wasp pops out of the carcass. <laughs> and if it's a female, she will start the cycle all over again. As you can already see, we have a lot in common. <laughs> you all have turned to the natural world for your ideas and inspirations, while mine are rooted in the natural world and have ex been expanded to Mars and beyond. I started studying caves because of my fascination with bats. Back in 2011, I had the opportunity to study a proposed tourist cave in Belize. This cave supports a tremendous roost, an estimated quarter of a million bats. And the cave serves as a maternity roost, supporting mother bats and thousands of cute little hairless pups. Wow, you guys are stoked about bats. That's so awesome. <laughs> I had just completed my first remote sensing course as part of my master's program, and I wanted to learn more about how to detect caves using thermal imaging from both satellites and aircraft. So I went to Belize with two objectives in mind. First, I wanted to study bats and learn more about cave bugs in a tropical rainforest. And secondly, I wanted to further develop my ideas concerning how to detect caves using thermal imaging. Well, the project was a huge success. I learned a lot about caves, and I was hooked. I knew from that moment forward that I wanted to devote my life to the study of caves. Unfortunately, the cave where I was working at was not going to be a good study site. It was within a dense jungle. And most satellite and, um, and aircraft-borne imagery need to actually see the ground. So with the closed canopy of a rainforest, this simply wasn't going to happen. Caves support some of the most sensitive ecosystems on Earth. So if we can develop a way to systematically detect caves, we can locate more caves more efficiently. Once we do this, we can then inventory the animal communities that use those caves 
and identify the most important caves for conservation. But first, if I was going to learn how to detect caves using thermal imaging, I had to, de I had to conduct this study in a desert or perhaps another planet, Mars. In that very moment, the nascent idea of the Earth-Mars Cave Detection Project was born. Now that we know why caves on Earth are important, why are caves on Mars so important? Well, first and perhaps most importantly, if life existed or exists on Mars, we will find that evidence underground. And this would be one of the greatest discoveries of humanity. This would shake many global worldviews to their very core and would redefine how humankind views itself in the universe. Secondly, studies suggest some caves on Mars may contain significant water ice deposits. So once we send a team to Mars, we'll certainly want to bring them back to Earth at some point. Unfortunately, our current capabilities will afford us a one-way trip. So access to significant water ice deposits would not only be required to make hydrogen fuel for that return trip, but could also be used for human consumption. Finally, because the Martian surface is blasted with violent windstorms and cosmic radiation, NASA may desire to build temporary or permanent astronaut, or speleonaut, bases underground. Cave entrances would provide us with that access. So with all of this information stuffed into my quiver, I assembled a team of astrophysicists and astrogeologists, and we started writing proposals. In 2005, NASA funded our uh, proof of concept study. 2008 rolled around, and NASA funded us for three more years. Our objective was to study thermal behavior in the Mojave Desert of Southern California and the Atacama Desert of Northern Chile, and then relate this information to understanding how best to detect caves on Mars using thermal imaging. In 2009, a sister project was funded by NASA, and I became an associate investigator on that study to study the massive volcanic vertical pits, or pit craters, on the Big Island of Hawaii. As luck would have it, this was the best location to study caves similar to those we found on Mars. But all of this work culminated in 2011 with a mission to collect thermal imagery from a NASA aircraft in the Mojave Desert. We now have over 17,000 images from this mission, not to mention years of ground-based temperature measurements from over 20 caves on two continents. But a lot more work needs to be done. Accurately detecting caves using thermal imaging is only the first step to the exploration of caves on the red planet. Once we can do this reliably, or at least somewhat reliably, our next step would be to develop and test a rover that can actually enter a Martian cave, perhaps a robotic snake, crab, or spider. We will then need a rover that can successfully navigate the often formidable subterranean realm. Cave floors are often covered by jumbled boulders, fissures, and often have deep vertical shafts. So our robotic cave explorer will not only have to be acrobatic, but we'll also have to be able to descend into holes and perhaps even climb walls. It will have to be a robotic caver. We'll also have to figure out the payload for a stealthy, acrobatic, robotic caver. All of the instruments needed to search for the evidence of life will have to be tremendously miniaturized. I envision the entire payload fitting within a medium-sized backpack. Clearly, at this point, we've entered the science fiction realm once again. However, a dream of mine is that within my lifetime, this will become science fact. Everything that I've shared with you has taken place over the past decade. I've worked with NASA on several projects. I've studied cave ecosystems all over the world. Colleagues and I have identified nearly 50 new species of insects from the American Southwest and Easter Island. And we've been publishing science papers on all of this work. When I first embarked upon this journey, many told me that I could never make a career out of studying caves. Fortunately, I didn't listen. I honed in on what I was most passionate about, and today I'm beginning to make some significant contributions to both terrestrial and interplanetary speleology. We're all here because we're driven by the desire to do what makes us happy. We found our purpose in life, and we've pursued it with vigor. Most of us have refused to punch a time clock or work in a maze of cubicles. We're here to push the envelope. We're here to break boundaries, both scientifically 
and creatively. It's what we do best. For those of you receiving awards tonight, I offer to you my heartfelt congratulations. You've allowed your curiosity to ride shotgun, and you've held your dreams sacrosanct. Your diligence has indeed paid dividends, and you are setting new boundaries. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share my story with you all tonight. I hope I have given at least one of you fodder for a Martian cave bug story. Thank you very much.